How about for the class? <laughs> All right, well, welcome to class. This is a Bible study class, as everyone knows. Uh, we study the Word of God boldly here. Today, um, Doug Tilstra is teaching. He's in Walla Walla, Walla Walla, Washington. And I always say this about Doug. It's 7 a.m. for you, right? <laughs> so on Saturday morning, man is getting out of bed at 6 to teach. That is a love for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in prayer, asking you for your blessing over this class. And for those that can't be here with us, we thank you for the technology that brings the class members and Doug to us. We pray that you will fill Doug with the Holy Spirit mightily as he leads us through your word. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Doug? Well, before we begin, I have to just, would you zoom the camera in, please, Abner, on Jason Smith? I'm pretty sure that that's the Jason Smith that I know. <laughs> Is it? Jason? Yeah. So good to see you. It's good to see you too, Pastor. Really good to see you. You it's took... Right. Hello, Angel, right? Yes, good to meet you, Angel. Nice to meet um, you. Jason, you took classes for me back, what was it, 2000, 2001, somewhere back in there? It's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. I was just thinking about you the other day. And... Um, I thought, you know, I wonder where Jason is, what he's doing. Anyway, this is not the time to catch up, but I just want you to know it is really, really good to see you. So you as well. thank you for being here. Well, back to, back to everybody in the whole class. Um, we are studying a passage today from Matthew chapter 6. And it's a familiar passage because it contains the, uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And that's a title we've given to it. It's really a template prayer that Jesus gave us on uh, some very good subject matter for us to pray about. Sadly, I doubt that we'll spend much time on that today because it is embedded in the middle of three little vignettes, one on giving, one on prayer, where the Lord's Prayer is, and then one on fasting. And each of these vignettes have some real similarities to them, and it's part of the bigger picture of the Sermon on the Mount. And we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount the last three or four weeks, and we have a couple more to go. And I want us to see how this part of the Sermon on the Mount fits into the bigger picture of what Jesus is doing. So before we go there, let me ask you about travel posters. Travel posters are not as common as they used to be. Now it's more online. You see a little pop-up online and you'll see some online travel poster that's advertising some resort or some beach that they want you to visit or something like that. How many of you have seen a travel poster or pop-up recently? Can, can you raise your hand? Anybody seen one? Okay, okay. Um, so my next question is, did the picture grab your attention. Uh, we're so used to ignoring those sort of things. Did it, did it grab your attention? Did it grab your attention and make you say, oh, I'm curious, where is that? Uh, maybe that's something I'd like to, to check out or that's a place I'd like to go. Anybody have that reaction? Okay, not, not as many. Again, we are in, in the habit of, of ignoring those things. Um, so think for a moment, whether it was recently or not, of seeing a travel poster or a travel pop-up that really did catch your attention so that you actually clicked on it or you checked out and said, where is that? I wonder if I could visit there. Stop and just pause for a moment to think about that. One that caught your attention enough so that you actually checked into it. You actually took a moment to say, where is that? Or you know, what would it cost to get there? Or have I been there before? Okay, anybody, did anything come to your mind? And we're not gonna take a long time on this, but, but what was it that caught your attention in, in the travel poster or the travel pop-up? Anybody? Doug, I like beaches. Okay. So palm trees and white sand and beautiful water, got me. Got your attention, you're in, okay. Anybody else? Uh, Abner, sure. 
uh, many years ago, my wife and I went on our first cruise, and as we were pulling into Labadee, Haiti, and the ship was rotating, I remember the look on my wife's face as she was seeing the blue water and smelling the air. And I suddenly realized all those pamphlets and things online that she'd looked at for years meant something completely different to her than they did to me because I grew up always being shipped off to Puerto Rico to my relatives, which I did not like. <laughs> and so it was a different thing. So those, yeah. those posters and pamphlets and things online were something very special to her. Wow. Thank you, Abner. Thank you. Anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Okay, this may be a very inadequate metaphor, but let me draw it and see if it connects with you. There's a sense, a very small sense, in which the Sermon on the Mount is a travel poster. Jesus is saying, I'd really like you to consider not just visiting, but living in the kingdom of God. And I know that you think you know what the kingdom of God is all about, but let me paint a picture of it. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. This is what it looks like. And if this is attractive to you, if you're drawn to this, please consider making this your home. Not just visiting, but coming and making it your home. Now, again, that metaphor may not work for you. But I'd like for you to consider that the entire Sermon on the Mount is a proclamation of what the kingdom of God is all about, to be sure. And it's also an invitation saying, if this is the sort of life that you would like to live, check it out. Because I would really like for you to be a part of this. And so that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is a declaration, it's an invitation that says, this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And for the people of Jesus' day, the kingdom of God meant something very different than it did to Jesus. We've talked about that in the past. And Jesus is painting the picture as clearly as he can so that people can honestly say, hmm, that sounds good. I would like that. That's different than what I expected, but I would like to be a part of that. And Jesus is inviting people to come and be a part of this kingdom, to live there permanently, forever. Now, in the process of doing that, he paints a number of smaller pictures that give us glimpses, certainly not the full panoramic view, but give us glimpses into what this kingdom is and is not. And in today's passage, he gives us three vignettes, three little pictures of what the kingdom is not, and by contrast, what it is. And interestingly enough, these all have to do with religious practices. And these all have to do with things that people who talked a lot about the kingdom of God said, oh, this is what the kingdom of God is all about. And Jesus was saying, not at all. Kingdom of God is not about that. It's about the exact opposite of that. So I want you to keep that in mind. That's the lens through which we're going to be looking at this. Gordon, did I see your hand? I, I thought maybe you, you had your hand up. No. Okay. Okay, probably just scratching your face. Um, and here's the lens through which we're going to look at it. And that is, Jesus is giving us a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is not. And by contrast, what it is. And before we end today, my hope is that we will have a clearer picture of what it means to live today, right now in the world where we find ourselves, in the job where we are, in the neighborhood where we live, with our current circle of friends and acquaintances, what does it mean to experience the kingdom of God right now? Because this is a little taste of what it's going to be like when we have the full experience of the kingdom of God in eternity. This is the beginning of it. 
And what does the kingdom of God look like, feel like, taste like? What is the kingdom of God like right now? How do we experience it now? Let's go to our passage, and let's start reading with Matthew chapter 6. And our passage is Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18. Please, comment. Go ahead, Gordon. Yes, Gordon. Um, you know, I couldn't help but think here. Uh, I don't know how many times he does this, but on more than one occasion, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is light. Yep. Yep. Let me say something. It might be interesting to take all of those and put them together. Yes. Yes. In addition to the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent thought, Gordon. And and if somebody is looking for uh, a project to do in their personal Bible study, that would be a, a really good one. And as we go through the remainder of our study of the life of Jesus, when we come across those, Gordon, please be sure and remind us that that would be a good thing to look for. Yeah. Good thought. Thank you. Okay, let's read Matthew chapter 6. And if you're in the harmony, you'll notice that Matthew and Luke both record the Sermon on the Mount, but Luke doesn't have a lot to say about this. When we get to the Lord's Prayer, Luke does record that, but he doesn't say anything about these other three little vignettes. So this is coming largely from the book of Matthew. And if you don't have the harmony open, then just using your, uh, your regular Bible is, is great because this is largely coming from Matthew. I'll be reading aloud here from the New, New International Version, which is the same thing as in the harmony. Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who gives what is, uh, pardon me, then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go to your room, Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it, before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men what, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting. But only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, 
who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this passage as a whole, and then we're going to go back and look at each of the three sections on needing, uh, giving, and on prayer, and on fasting, and look at what they have in common, and even some of the repeated phrases, and then we're going to zoom back out again and say, what's the big message here? What is Jesus saying that the kingdom of heaven is and is not? What picture is he painting of the kingdom of heaven here? So let's, let's start out with a, with a zoomed out lens, with a wide angle lens, and that is the type of people that Jesus is saying not to be like, those who are blowing trumpets when they give offerings, and those who are standing on the street corners praying out loud so that people will watch them, and those who are disfiguring their faces when they fast so that people will feel really sorry for them, those people. What word might you use to describe people like that? Let me hear some. Humble. I'm sorry? Humble. Humble. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Other words? Pompous. Oh, I thought you said, I thought you said who is going to be there. You may want to restate the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what kind of word would you use to describe right. these people that Jesus is saying not to be like? Don't be like these people. Yeah. <laughs> the humble. <laughs> Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Okay, that's the word Jesus uses. What other words would you use? Actor. Actors. Okay. Ego maniacs. Yeah. I'm sorry. What kind of maniacs? Ego. Ego maniacs. Okay. What else? Right. Showing up. Okay, I heard online here somebody. Showing up. Showing up. Okay. Thank you, Eduardo. Right. What else? Bragging. Bragging, okay. Pretentious. I heard oh, I missed one there. Go ahead. I said selfish. Selfish, okay. okay. Status seekers. Status seekers. Yeah, lots of good words. And the, the word that I used in the lesson that, that we sent out uh, last week was show-offs. That's, that's one. I also asked a question about class clowns. Abner, you look like there's a problem with the screen. Is there, is there something? Go ahead. I, I want, well, actually, this is a prime opportunity. Those of you that are online, don't raise your hand, speak up. Doug is operating off of a small monitor. He can't see everybody. So just. Oh, I, but I did see your hand, Keith. I'm sorry to miss you. Please go ahead. Many people are insecure who do that. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Insecure. Yeah. How about anybody? Uh, Anybody else? Uh, how about unsaved? Unsaved, okay. Okay. Excellent words. Now, in the in the lesson that we sent out, the first question I asked you was about a class clown. And I don't know if that's something that you remember from fifth grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, somewhere in there. Anybody remember a class clown who was quite a show off? That was me, Doug. <laughs> that was you, Abner. Okay. That, that was me. And anyone who's ever dealt with a class clown knows that class clowns actually are class clowns because of their experience. Yeah. And I missed that. Anybody who knows that a, a class clown is what? Anyone who's ever dealt with a class clown knows that they are the class clown because of their insecurities. And I was very insecure. Yeah. I was always a huge kid. So I always yeah. just uh, I hated it. Yeah. And so you were acting out, you were showing off to try to compensate for that insecurity. Yes. Okay. Wow. Right. Jason, I, I think your hand was up, please. I think that sometimes <laughs> when people do these type of things, it's because they're trying to fill a need yeah. with something that is the best that they know how. Yeah. You know, yeah. So in this instance, not all of these people might actually be uh, awful, horrible hypocrites. They yeah. just might think this is real righteousness. So yep. they don't know the righteousness that Jesus really gives. Yeah. They figure, well, this is at least appear righteous or yeah. do this performance piece because that's what righteousness really is. Yes. 
Yes. And, and Jason, thank you for giving these people the benefit of the doubt that they are doing something that they're hoping will, will bring some benefit, but it's not really filling the need that they want. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, Gordon. I know from my own past experiences that the, we were created for relationships mm -hmm. and relationship with God and with other people. And if we're wounded in that area, thinking along the lines of what the gentleman just said, if we're wounded in that area, sometimes we crawl into a hole yeah. or sometimes we seek other ways to try to connect. Yep. yep. And uh, even inappropriate ways. Yep. Yep. Oh, excellent comments. Let me pull these. Did I miss a hand? I, I didn't want to miss somebody. Doug? Yes, please, Roy. What I was going to say is I think we have, a using this as a metaphor, a language problem. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you live in a foreign land that speaks a different language and you don't know the language, it is difficult for you to integrate into that culture or that way mm -hmm. and the language is we were born selfish mm -hmm. and god is asking us to become unselfish and if we don't understand the unselfish language then we have difficulty in being consistent and monitoring together yeah and wow. especially to me is uh the holy spirit because the holy spirit speaking to us an unselfish language and oh. we don't fully uh, grab it. Excellent comment. Thank you, Roy. That selfishness is so key here. And we may not even realize the depth of our selfishness. Yeah. Well, here's excellent comments. Let me tie this back then. Marge, big, yeah. big picture. Did I miss somebody else? Marge? Go ahead, Mark. Well, I had mentioned to you before class started that in my teaching experience and then in my long life, I know of a number of show-offs, mm -hmm. class clowns, who ended up to be very effective preachers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because yeah. they have a gift of communication. Yeah. When they're younger, it may be inappropriate, but as they grow in the Lord, they can turn that into something appropriate and yeah. useful. Yeah. And Marge, I'm, I'm debating whether or not to jump off that comment quite yet. Let's, let me make a brief comment, and then I'm going to come back to that, because I think that's really a worthwhile comment. But here's, here's the big picture, and that is that what we're noticing here, as Jesus is painting a picture of what the kingdom of heaven is not, the kingdom of heaven is not about people who are showing off and selfish people who are standing blowing trumpets to get people to look at them and what they're doing. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. It's about something very different than that. So that, that's big picture. And we'll, we'll drill down and say, well, so what is he saying? Because that's, that's pretty obvious. But is there something beneath the surface? Is there something more subtle? Is there something that is more nuanced here? And I think there is. And, and I'd like us to look at that. And, and as far as your comment, Marge, and that is people who are show off as kids and then how that develops, I'd like to come back to that. And Abner, you and I may be the only two people in this room who are class clowns in the sixth grade. Well, if you're um, that means there's hope for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I know the process that God had to take me through to deal exactly with what you're saying, Marge. So we may be able to come back to that toward the end there. Cause I think that it's, I think it's not something we just automatically grow out of. I think there are people who stay class crown class clowns or some type of show up way past the sixth grade. And it can happen into their sixties even. And, and it's not, it's not very lovely. In fact, it can be quite unlovely. And the kingdom of God is not about that type of unloveliness. The kingdom of God is about something far better than that. And Jesus is, is calling our attention to that. And, and it's interesting, the way he does this is to tell three stories that are very similar to each other to emphasize this point. And it's that point that I want us to get into. 
And Gordon will take this as the last comment before we transition. Yes, sir. It just struck me that the, there are so many people in the world that suffer in the area of relationships, mm -hmm. securities, whatever. And in heaven, that goes away. Yeah. God is going to fix that for everyone. Yes. yes. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and Gordon, you're underscoring this, this very point, and that is the kingdom of God is about healing people so they can be in relationship with one another without hurting one another, without blowing trumpets in each other's ears to say, look at me. And the kingdom of God is about healing those types of things in our lives. Thank you. Good thought. Okay, one more comment. John, this is the last, last comment before we transition. You know something, Doug? I am an introvert. Mm -hmm. If I had lived during Jesus' day and I had been taught that if you want to be God's child, you should pray on the street corners and you should give alms openly. Mm. Such an introvert. I would not want to pray mm. on the street corner, but yeah. to, to show that I was willing to be loyal to God, I would have done it. Oh. Even though I did not want to. Wow. I would have gone through the motions hoping yeah. God give me the emotions. Wow. That's a really helpful comment, John, because it tells us again, back to Jason's comment, that just because we see people doing certain behaviors doesn't mean that they're doing them for the same reasons. In, in the case that you mentioned, you might be doing it because you really have a heart for God. And you say, well, if this is what I'm supposed to do, I better do it. And yet Jesus says, that's it's a dead end. It's not going to go anywhere. Thank you. Wow. Good stuff. I always learn so much when I come to this class. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Jason, another comment. This is the last, last, last comment. <laughs> well, I, I looked at the structure of what we're dealing with here, and I think you can actually see that in the text itself. Mm -hmm. If you notice the first two issues that Jesus talks about telling people not to do, yeah. he says they're doing it to be seen by men yep. or to get glory from men. Yep. If you look at the third one who's praying, yeah. they actually think they have to do this so God will hear them. Yes. So they are actually doing it using many words in their prayer and repetition saying, I think this is the way God will hear me. Yes. So you can actually see sincerity of purpose yeah. in yeah. the prayer. And yes. Jesus saying, really, this is an issue of you not understanding God's character. You think that God is like these men like yes. and that's not actually it oh that is so good <laughs> better than i could have said it jason thank you really really good because think about how jesus heart must have ached let's let's put together what jason said and what john just said think how jesus heart must have ached for people who were looking at their religious leaders and saying i guess that's what god's like <laughs> Just think how that must have made Jesus' heart ache. Douglas, can you please repeat what Jason said? Yeah. Jason said that if you look at the section on prayer and at verse 7, he says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need. He said that the real problem here with these people is that they honestly think this is what they need to do. They think this is what God wants of them. And it isn't what God wants of them. Does that make sense, Marlene? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Good, good stuff. Thank you. Jason, it's good to have you back in class again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to start doing what, we, what we've already dipped into, and that is look at these three sections. So there's the first one on giving that starts in verse 1 and goes to verse 4. And then there's the next one on prayer that starts in verse five and it goes to verse eight. Um, and you could even, you could even take it just to verse six, because then after that is really the section on the Lord's prayer and the section that Jason just pointed out, but, but look at five and six on prayer and then drop down to fasting and look at verses 16 through 18 and just take a moment. I'm going to give you a moment. I want you to compare these three different little vignettes 
And what are the repeated phrases that you see? Because the repeated phrases tell us something about what Jesus is saying is really important here because he says them over and over. There's, there's several repeated phrases. See if you can locate some of them. What are the repeated phrases here in each of these stories? And okay, I see a hand. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Linda. Linda. Okay, so Linda, what's one that you see? Glenda. Um, Glenda, oh, Glenda. I'm sorry, Glenda. Glenda, what's one that you see? The, they've received their reward in full, and I'm thinking yeah. that, that was maybe a one time thing instead of an eternal reward. Yeah. Yeah. They have their reward in full. That's report, repeated in each of these little vignettes. Three times. Thank you. Somebody else, what's another repeated phrase that you see? Do not. I'm sorry, say it again. Do not. Do not. Yeah, do not, do not, do not. Good. <clears throat> Somebody else, what's another repeated phrase that you see? Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Yes, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That's repeated three times. Somebody else. There's several, there's a couple more. Uh, yes, sure. Mike. It's, it's not a precise re repetitive statement, but the idea is repetitive where he says to be honored by men, to be seen by men, and to be heard by men. Yes, good. Okay, so this whole idea of being noticed by other people. Good, good, good students. Anybody else? I tell you the truth. Good. I tell you the truth. He's repeating that. Are there any others? Anything else you notice? Okay. Did I miss any hands? Okay, Abner, I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see okay. if I can make this work. And let's see here. You said Alt S. And then I hit this. And then I hit Sh share is it sharing now yes. okay so here i put these three little vignettes side by side so there's the giving and there's the prayer and the fasting and you've you've already called all of these so now let me put it all together and and just watch what happens here every one of these ends with almost identical wording the first one then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you next one then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Last one. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus ends each one of these little vignettes with exactly that same phrase. And we'll come back to some of this a little bit later, but notice the key words here. It's God that's responding to you. And if we're thinking about Jesus painting a picture of the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about what happens in relationships. This is what relationships look like in the kingdom of heaven. And one of the primary relationships is the way that God relates to us. And God is eager to connect with us. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So a key word here is the father. Another key word is reward. And we'll come back to that in a minute because the question that I have for you, and I want you to think about this, what is the reward? Jesus doesn't seem to spell it out here. He just says that you'll get the reward. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So is the reward eternal life? Is it heaven? Is it getting to play with, with tame lions? I mean, what is the reward? And, and just tuck that away. I, I don't want you to answer at the moment. But notice that each one of these ends with that same phrase. Now, let me scroll and look at another phrase that's repeated. And this is one that somebody else mentioned. Mike, I think, um, no, I don't know that you mentioned this. Somebody mentioned this, I think. Notice <clears throat> that in every one, there's a repeated phrase that God can't be seen. In the first one, your father in heaven. Well, we, we don't see God. He's in heaven. In the next one, your father who is unseen. And then in the last one, the father who is unseen. So there's this idea that you can't see God. But don't worry, he's there and he is acting on your behalf. And again, the kingdom of heaven here and now is different in that 
We don't see God right now. Someday we will see God face to face. But right now, God is unseen. And that, that troubles us sometimes. We say, where is God? I can't see him. And Jesus is acknowledging that in the kingdom of God, as we experience it right now, we can't see God. He is unseen. And he acknowledges that in each of these little vignettes. Your father in heaven, your father who is unseen, your father who is unseen. Notice another repeated one. You've mentioned this one. This is an interesting contrast. It's almost comical. While your father can't be seen, you are doing everything that you can to be seen. You want to make sure that people are looking at you, hearing you. You're wanting to make yourself fill the screen and be prominent. Notice how he says it in the first one. In front of others, to be seen by them. Or in the second one, to be seen by others. Or in the last one, to show others they are fasting. Interesting. The contrast on the one hand between God is unseen, but I am doing my best to be seen. Just tuck that away. And then finally, while he does not define what the reward is that these people are going to get when they respond well to God, he does define what the reward is for those who are not responding well to God. Notice that in the giving in the first one, the trumpets, that's their reward. Da, 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 da. Okay, there's your reward, all done. And on the prayer, standing on the street corner. Okay, there you go, that's your reward. You're standing on the street corner, people are looking at you. There's your reward, you got it in full. And then the fasting, well, they disfigured their faces. There you go. There's your reward. You've got a disfigured face. Hope you like it. There's your reward. It is paid in full. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here and come back. What do you make of all that? Jesus is obviously telling these stories very intentionally. And he repeats these same phrases and he contrasts these ideas of being seen and unseen. That's a big, big theme in these stories. What do you make of all that? Let me hear from you. Please. Uh, I think Dwayne is first, and then I'll come to the other hand that was up. Oh, let's go to Dwayne first. How did the Jews disfigure their face? Do you have an answer to that? I, I have a thought, but I don't know that I have an authoritative response. If you have a, an answer from the margin of your Bible, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, they put ashes all over their face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I would have guessed. That it would have been putting ashes on your face. There was another hand in the back. Putting oil and washing the face were reserved for joyous occasions. Yeah, yeah. Great thought. Thanks, Dwayne. I always appreciate the historical comments you bring from from the margins there. Okay, there was another hand over here. Let's go to the hand on the other side of the room. Doug? Yes. Um, we believe that we get salvation as a gift. We yep. don't earn it. Yep. But Paul mentioned reward. The yep. same way this reward was mentioned here. Yep. Paul says those who seek God he will reward them. Uh -huh. And if you are seeking God and you're looking for a reward, what would that reward be? <laughs> yes. Hold that thought. I'm sorry, you, you, you weren't finished and I interrupted you. Go ahead. What would your reward be if you were seeking God but to get God? Mm. That, would, that, that would follow. If, if I'm seeking God and he rewards me, He's not going to reward me with things. Yeah. He's going to reward me with him. Yes, yes. That is actually the punchline. It's almost like we could have the benediction now. <laughs> no, that really is. That is. And, and just hold that thought because I, I want to come back to it, but that's really, really good. Thank you. Anybody else? What, what do you make of this whole thing as you, as you look at Marlene? Did you have a comment? Can you hear me? I can. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Pretty much what the gentleman said. Uh, to me, it's very difficult to define the kingdom of heaven. 
Mm -hmm. And I can live with the hope that I will get to heaven and I will see God and Jesus and everyone else. Um, however, what Jesus, I think it's trying to tell me is don't wait for that time. The mm. kingdom of heaven is now. And the reward that you have is my presence in you, my peace, my, my friendship, my support, my comfort. Yeah. So do, do not worry if others don't see you. But I do. Yeah. <laughs> I do know what you're, you're going through and I'm here with you. So I, I think this is beautiful. Yeah, so well put. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Sure. Did, did I miss any other hands? Wendy. Yeah, we've got a comment in the class. Okay. Please. It's Wendy. Um, Hi, Wendy. Hey. So if God tells Abraham, I am your reward, Mm -hmm. And when someone, one of these three people, the trumpet, now he's got the reward, it's about him. If it's switched where in secret we are talking to God and his reward is himself, then that puts us, him being God, and we are yes. Yes. viewing basically it's the ten commandments you know that shall have no other gods before yes me. when he's the reward if we got to make ourselves have our own reward then we become a god over over him yes and jason i'll come to you in just a second but wendy you tied together two beautiful things thou shalt have no other gods before me in the ten commandments and god saying to abraham i am your reward i am your reward and these people are looking for such puny rewards. They're looking for a little trumpet blast to call attention to them. They're looking for people to see their disfigured faces. They, oh, they're a good person. They're looking for somebody to hear them babbling on the street corner and say, oh, that must be a really holy person. And that's such a puny reward. And, and God says, I want to give you something so much bigger. And you're settling for this puny little reward. I am your reward. Wendy, thank you. Yeah, Jason. I, I really see this as, and it ties into what she said. Either your your God is humanity and legalism, mm. or you have a distortion of the character of the true God. Mm. And because if, if I think about it, if, if we were to say here to everyone, listen, I'll give you a reward up here in front of everyone, some cash. And everyone will see it. Or Bill Gates is going to privately put a deposit into your account. Yeah, yeah. And either you might must not know who Bill Gates is, yeah. or you don't believe in his generosity if you take it from me. Yeah. Okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm seeing, and, and to me it's so crazy because if if what they really want is this thing. The, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 that the good works of men cannot be completely hidden. Mm -hmm. and even the ones that are can't be completely uh, hidden. So, so if you are really seeking God, God's reward is going to impact you even now. Yeah. And, and people will be able to tell and they'll know. Yeah. I'm like, it, it just blows my mind about how backwards we are in yeah. that the thing that they're seeking could actually really still be theirs through God if they would just go. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jason. Sometimes Jesus' kingdom is called the upside down kingdom because everything that we think we know is turned on its head. And this is another one of those cases that we think what we want is to blow the trumpet, to disfigure our face, to have people look at us and say, wow, they're good. And, and it doesn't really bring us what we want. And Jesus says, turn it upside down, come at this a whole different way, and you'll find that your heart's desires really met. Okay, we have two hands here. And Gordon, I'm going to take the hand in front of you first, and then I'll take your hand. Uh, I'm just reminded that I am them. Because in my Christian walk through my life, I thought, okay, I got it. That's what, then I learned something else. I'm like, okay, I didn't have it. Then it's like, okay, now I got it. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yes. And we want to be pointing our fingers at them or he, you know, and it's hard to point our fingers at ourselves. So yeah. you know, we're all alike. Yes. In fact, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Rhonda. Rhonda. In fact, Rhonda, your comment, oh, I'm just finding so many things to resonate with in it. That there are times when I have said that about myself, too. I said, well, I, I remember one time 20 years ago or so, I actually had the thought, you know, I'm not sure I can get any more mature than I am. I, I think I'm kind of about as mature as I'm going to get. Well, and I look back and I think, I was to the height of immaturity when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the other thing that, oh, I just, I, I'm really resonating with what you're saying. Thank you. It's, it's very, very helpful. And Jesus is calling us to something so much bigger, so much better. And we really don't grasp what it is. Yeah. Gordon. Well, you know, I, I think about the people that hear him say these things. So often in the Bible, it's a little obscure what the real meaning is. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why he did that here, for example. I mean, he could have said that I'll come and get to know you better, mm -hmm. or I'll commune with you, or mm -hmm. something else. And instead he said, I'll reward you. What are the, yeah. what are, can you imagine these shepherds or woodworkers figuring this out? We're struggling. Yeah, yeah. Gordon, you've brought this up before, and I think it's a good question. And that is, why does it seem like Jesus is obscure sometimes? Why doesn't he just come out and say, I want to be friends with you? And to be, to be true, he does actually say that in other places. But why doesn't he say it here? And, and I agree with you that there, there's sometimes a question in my mind, why didn't he say this instead of that? And I think I have some ideas on it. Um, I don't know what I want to get off too far in that path right now, but do you have any ideas on why Jesus might have said it the way he did here and said, you'll be rewarded, but then not say what that reward was? The only thing I can think of, and it doesn't quite make sense, is that he knew that at some future time, people like us would get together and figure it out. <laughs> okay, I, I think you're not on the wrong track there. Yes, please. Me, me. Um, Rhonda is, is next, but I think that right next to you, Gordon, uh, and I'm blanking on your name, I'm sorry. Stacy. Stacy, yeah. Uh, I would imagine if he says God will reward you, if he actually listed so we can be better friends to them, that might be obscured. Like, he <laughs> can he be their friend when he's not even there? Oh, good not point. Like it's also very limiting because not only being friends with God would be a reward, but so is eternal life. So yep. is uh, an immense type of joy that the stresses that we have, yep. death yep. and the abuses, we'll have, we'll have new bodies that never get yep. sick and have yep. a splendid, splendid for us. Okay. Oh, garden to live in. Um, if he would actually start listing it, he, eternity would come and he wouldn't be done listing all the rewards. <laughs> so it's almost like poetry that the word is so well chosen, you can unpack it endlessly because as you look at other things that Jesus says, okay. it makes sense what he's talking about as a reward. Okay. We'll go to Rhonda and then I think um, Keith has a comment. Yeah. Oh, Marlene, I think just a second though, Marlene, I think Rhonda was next. Yeah. Rhonda and then Marlene and then Keith. Yeah, when I read a book, it's like, okay, that's a good book. Now I want to read another book. But I, when I read the Holy Bible, Jesus is asking me a lot of questions. And I'm asking Jesus a lot of questions. Yeah. But if I read the Holy Bible and put it down and said I got it, then <laughs> there's going to be a lot of drama. Yeah, it keeps us thinking. Yeah. Keeps us thinking. Okay, Marlene and then Keith. Yeah, in the same vein, the reward is different according to our need. Mm. or our needs every one of us is different and in all eras you know people had different needs so to me right now it might be just having his peace and somebody else is having him as a friend or as a comforter so that's why he's leaving an open-ended uh, proposition there yeah so that actually it makes us think because if he says my reward is money i'm not uh I, I, I'm not motivated by money or my reward is peace. What is peace, you know? So yeah. he leaves it for us to fill in the blank. 
I love it. And then we'll go to Rhonda and then Bonnie online has her hand up. Me. I'm done. <laughs> You're done. Okay, so let's go to Bonnie. I was just going to say, as a teacher, many times in the classroom, I ask open ended questions, or a student will ask a question, and I'll answer uh, very open endedly so that I draw the students out yeah. and yeah. get them to do their own thinking rather than just giving them a pat answer. Yeah. I think many times Jesus does that. Yeah, um, he's purposely somewhat vague so that we can do our own thinking and our own digging and our own growing. Yeah, good comment. Thank you, Bonnie. Who did I miss? I, I want us to move forward. Okay, Roy. Roy has a comment, and then let's gather all the comments out there. Yeah, I was going back to the metaphor of the language mm. because um, the Holy Spirit has to interpret our or intercede in our prayers because of our lack of really fully understanding. So I see that as being the standard of mm -hmm. understanding is uh, what the Holy Spirit is. But the point I wanted to make here is that one of the things that I think is weak on our part, and it's partly because we don't understand the language of selfishness effectively, mm -hmm. is that we don't really experience our prayers as fully as we should mm. and it is with the holy spirit and the prayers focusing in our hearts that is going to give us the ability to become uh, more unselfish in our uh daily life as well as our thoughts and thinking yes and in understanding yes. the language yep yes yes Back to the whole language of selfishness or unselfishness. Thank you, Roy. Who else did I miss? Did I miss another I, comment? I, yes, I, Casey. I, think, I think, Pastor, that if Jesus had limited it, then he'd be doing the very same thing he's trying to cure them of. <laughs> so, so he's saying to them that, I, and I, I think Jesus oftentimes, he, he told us his kingdom was like a seed. Mm -hmm. and a seed has to grow it has to be nurtured it has to and when you it's really about going to god and finding out who he is because you have to go to him and say what is this reward what is and jesus so often left things in a way that triggered the curiosity yeah and it, it changes the interests of the soul so that you start aligning over toward god and you yeah. start working because you're trying to figure it out and in that process, you get purged from sin. Yeah. And, and I think that's why he left it that way. And he, I think in freeing us from this legalism of this limited, oh, this, that, or the other, mm -hmm. he is reserving God's right to transcend all of our expectations in this yep. report yep. and give us something that is greater and deeper and more meaningful than we in our limitations can yeah. actually process. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Did I miss any other hands? Yes, Doug, I'd like to make yes. a comment. Please, Keith. Uh, two comments, actually. The first one is, it appears that he's meeting the people where they're at in the most simplistic things that he can. Mm -hmm. Just what they see on the street, what's around them. This is what they see, this is what they understand, and they can take and unpack the rest of it later. Yeah. yeah. The Second comment that I'd like to share is this semester in our Southern Connections class for the freshmen, we have people from all different areas, different places, different backgrounds. And I took the approach of let's begin to start heaven here. Oh, wow. Wow. Get to know each other because we're going to know each other for a long, long, long <laughs> yeah. time. So let's yeah. start here yeah oh okay thank you really good stuff okay i'm about to switch gears here we're coming into our last 10 minutes of class and i want to change gears slightly but i don't want to miss any hands did i miss anybody else Doug, i just have a quick question please Abner. we've kind of gone away from this already in the comments but this is, this is something that's always bothered me my whole life when it says put oil on your head and wash your face for me, the washing of the face, I get that, but the oil on the head, I don't get that. Was it a kind of oil that you were using that was refreshing? Because 
Oil. Yeah, good question. It, it's just <laughs> use your regular hygiene. That was regular hygiene. Okay. And so, you know, if, if you could say, you know, shampoo your hair and shave and, and do whatever your regular hygiene is. In other words, don't do something when you're fasting that is out of the ordinary that will make people say, oh, what's wrong with him? Gotcha. Thank you. Your regular hygiene. Yep. Yeah. Well, folks, here's the here's the direction I want to turn. I'm going to come clear back to, to Marge's comment, and I want to see if I can bring this thing full circle. I said that this was like a poster, a travel poster, where Jesus is saying, do you like this? You think you might like to visit here? You think you might like to live here? And some people will look at it and honestly say, no, thanks. We know that. We know that some people will look at what Jesus says and say, no, I'd rather have trumpets blowing for me. Thank you very much. And if that's my full reward, so be it. I'd rather disfigure my face. I would rather have people admiring me on the street corner. That's what I want. That's all I want out of life. I really want the applause and the accolades of people. And that will satisfy me completely. And Jesus as well, if that's what you want, okay that's not the kingdom of god but that you can have that that's your reward in full and whether you're doing it through religious stuff or non-religious stuff the effect is the same if you're living for the approval of other people and other people's approval and affirmation and applause and that's what you're living for you can do that and that's what you'll get that's all you'll get and I think most of us at some point come to a place where we say, that's pretty small. That's pretty shallow. That's pretty empty, hollow. But a lot of people never come to that point. And they live their lives for really small potatoes. And I think it makes Jesus very sad. But he says, if that's really what you want to live for, you, you may do that. But on the other hand, if you want a reward, and, and Jason, to use your, if you want Bill Gates to open his bank account to you, if you want Bill Gates to hand you his credit card and say, no limit on it, just, just you know, use it however you like. If that's what you want, we can make that happen too. So to bring this full circle, as Jesus is painting these pictures, and he says, do you want this? Do you want this? This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of humans. Which do you want? I would like in our time together, and as we wrap up this time together today, to say, please take a good hard look at what Jesus is offering. Because it really is pretty attractive. I, I hope that, that something about today has been attractive to you. And so I, I want to pull it back full circle by telling a little bit of my own story and without making it the, the central piece of this, and then come back to the scripture one more time and, and see how we can leave here with maybe a little bit more desire for the kingdom of God than we walked in with. That I, I mentioned that Abner and I might be the only two people who um, will admit to being the class clowns, or, or maybe we're actually the class clowns. <clears throat> and for me, it, it took place in the sixth grade. We had just moved from um, out of state and we moved to a new school. And in my previous five years of education, I had been kind of the wimpy, nerdy, unpopular kid. And I hit this new school determined that that was not going to be who I was. And quite quickly, I realized that I had a quicker tongue and a sharper, more clever um, ability to retort than my teacher did. And by the first week of class, I made it my studied goal every day in class to see if I could get the class laughing at her and making her the butt of the joke. And um, I'm not proud of that. In fact, years later, when I was teaching grades one through four as a student missionary, I wrote her an apology letter. <laughs> and I said, Mrs. Heinrich, I am so sorry for the way that I treated you when I was in sixth grade. She had retired by then. And she wrote me back a letter, which, which made me scratch my head. She said, 
well, thank you for the apology, but I don't really remember you being that different than any of the other students. And I thought, oh, well, was it really that bad for her? Or you know, what, what was going on there? Because I know what was going on for me. Anyway, for me, it was exactly like what, <clears throat> what, um, what Jesus points out here. And that is, there was a group of about five boys in that class who were the popular guys. And, and you guys know what it was like to be in grade school or high school or middle school. As a kid, you could tell who was popular. You knew who it was who ran that classroom. And you knew who it was that everybody wanted to be part of. And I had never been a part of the in-group. I had never been a part of that, of that popular group. And I was determined to get in. And again, to make a long story short, my my antics um, against the teacher worked and I made it into that group. And um, I was so proud of myself because I, I, had, I had accomplished my goal. I made it into that in group and I was their, their mouthpiece and they could use me to, to blast the teacher. So I got my reward in full. I, I bargained for something and I got it. Got my reward in full. Now to take this fast forward to, to Marge's comment. It wasn't until several decades later that I realized that what I had been doing in sixth grade, I was repeating in more sophisticated ways as an adult. And that, no, I was not doing the same crazy things that I've been doing in sixth grade. I had learned how to do it much more sophisticated and in, in ways that didn't get um, the same disapproval from refined society, but still gave me the applause that I wanted and felt like I needed from people around me. And again, to make a very long story short, Part of that happened early in, well, not early, but 10 years into my pastoral experience when I was working on a church planting project in the suburbs of Sacramento. And God allowed things to develop to the point where the people that I was working with in that church plant, the, the co-founders called me on my attitude and they asked me to resign. They oh. said, we don't want you to be our pastor anymore. And I thought, can they do that? <laughs> you know, this, this is my church plant. And I'm, I'm the one that's in charge here. Well, again, to make a long story short, that was the beginning of quite a long process for me where God was showing me where I was looking for my sense of well-being. Was I looking to God or was I looking to people? Was I looking to have my sense of, I'm okay. I am, I'm, I'm a worthwhile person. Was I looking to God or was I looking to people? And one of the things that grew out of that was the opportunity to realize that my primary identity was not being in a church, was not by being a church planter. My primary identity was not being a pastor. My primary identity is that I'm a loved child of God. Amen. That's my identity. That's what gives me value and worth. It's not blowing trumpets to get people to look at me. It's not disfiguring my face and hoping that people will say, well, now there's a sincere person. <laughs> my value, my sense of stability, my calmness, my well-being comes from the fact that I'm treasured by God as his son. That's it. And that, yes, I want to do good things. And yes, I want to do things that are worthwhile and I want to help people. And that's the amazing thing. Even through all of that, God was blessing people through me as immature as I was. He was still blessing people through me. How does God do that? He is just so gracious, so generous. But my immaturity was killing me. And God had to do something to change my immaturity so again a long story short it took quite a while before god could really get his finger on that in my life and say do you realize that you're doing the matthew 6 thing here 
that what you're really trying to do is get all your reward from other people. And when you're trying to get your reward from other people, that's all you're going to get. And so what I have found, Marge, to come back to where you started, is that yes, there are pastors who God has to take through a process because yes, their natural giftedness, and in this case, my communication that started by blasting my sixth grade teacher can be turned into something else. But really what God had to get to is my heart. He had to work in my heart and really change who I was deep down inside. And I think that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying even your religious stuff, whether it's praying, whether it's giving, whether it's fasting, even the religious stuff can be really rotten to the core, whether you know it or not. And if it's rotten to the core, you're only going to get the reward in full from rottenness. And that's not going to be very satisfying. So what I'd like to close on is this. I'd like you to reflect on what God is saying to you. It may not be disfiguring your face. It may not be blowing trumpets. It may not be playing the righteous person and praying out loud on the street corner. But what is it? What's going on in your life that's hollow and that's empty? And that really is not giving you anything but a very small reward. And Jesus wants to give you a huge reward. What is it? And now to come back to where I said really was the punchline. And that is, what's the reward? Well, we've defined it in a lot of ways. But could I point you to Matthew 5 and verse 8? Matthew 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. For they shall see God. This whole passage is about seen and unseen. Your father, who is unseen, can reward you. People are going to see either God or me. And if I'm filling up the screen, blowing a trumpet and shouting so that you can hear me, if I'm filling up the screen, then people won't see God. And I probably won't see him either. But if I don't mind being off stage, if I don't mind being in the background, people will see God. And that's what I want. I want to see God myself and I want other people to see God. And so this is a picture of the kingdom, people who are open to allowing God to do deep work in our lives so that instead of clamoring to fill the screen, we're allowing God to fill the screen. And then we can see God and other people can see God. And that's what the kingdom of God is all about. It's being in the presence of God and living forever in the presence of God, which can start right now. With that, thank you for participating. Thank you for engaging. And um, Abner, would you be willing to, to close the prayer for us? Sure. Be happy to. Our heads. Father, we thank you for meeting Doug through your word. We thank you for filling him with the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much that even through the technology of Zoom, that we can still have a lively class <laughs> that, um, that allows Doug to teach in the style that works for him. We thank you for being with us here today. We pray that you'll be with us as we go our separate ways this week and bring us safely back here again next Sabbath. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Really good to see you. And I don't mind.